This is the White Stag by Kate Cerity. A piercing scream rent the air, and all eyes toward turned towards the tent of Electa, the woman who Bendigas had left with his wife ran toward him, her face deathly paled, her eyes streaming with tears. You have a, a man-child, Bendigas, a mighty man-child, but Electa is dead. Part 4, Attila. On a summer night in the year 408, a flaming red comet appeared over Europe, striking terror into the hearts of all who saw it. A menacing omen, a flaming red comet shaped like a tremendous eagle with a sword in its talons. In that year, when the walls of Rome were cracking before the onslaught of the Goths led by King Alaric, when the Vandals were invading Hispania, led by King Gunderic, when Roman Britain was fighting a losing war against the terrible barbarian pirates, the Saxons, on the summer night of that year, Attila was born. And on that night did pity, tenderness, and love die forever in the heart of Bendigas. The thousands who had heard his reckless challenge and had witnessed the dreadful punishment could and, di could and did shed tears of pity for him. The eyes of Bendigaz were, were dry, his face a cold mask, for the heart within him had turned to stone. He did not see the hand of Hunar held out to him with pity and love. He did not feel the restraining hand of Deimos as he made his way once more to the now cold and dark altar. He did not see that even the most reckless and ruthless of his men covered their eyes and and fell to their knees when the, when he again mounted the steps and lifted his face to the sky when he uttered these words who dar powerful god thou hath indeed turned the sword against me thy sword who dar not mine but thou hast given me a, a scourge in that place that i swear to thee i been to god the white eagle that i shall use that scourge and that I shall make it into the most dreadful weapon ever known to men. Thou hast given me a son, Hudar. He will be that scourge, my son Attila, the red eagle, the scourge of God. And at that hour, Flavius Honorus, the Roman Empire, gazed out of the window of his palace in Milan, long and fearfully, at the flaming red car comet. He knew that the... The rent structure of the Roman Empire was tumbling and cracking under his feet. Might this fearful omen herald the end? From far came the sound of tolling church bells. From below came the sound of people praying in the streets and the droning voice of the friar. Woe unto you, for ye have built these scepters of the prophets, and your fathers killed them that the blood of the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of all nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing for fear, and for looking after those things, which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. At that hour, Christians and pagans all over Europe prayed that this dreadful thing approaching from the east might be averted from them. And in the dark tent between the river Rhea and the Tanis, a newborn child cried bitterly, 
cried for comfort and warmth and tenderness and love, cried for the things he was never to know. Early in the fall of that year, in the month of the Rom in the month the Romans called September, the great army of the Huns stood ready. It was night. Thick white mist hung close to the ground, but above countless stars glittered in the dark blue sky. The full white moon looked down on what seemed to be the reflection of countless stars on the ocean of white mist. Glittering tips of helmets, spears, javelins, phoenix upon on phallix of them. The great army of the Huns was waiting, listening to the last words of Magyar, whom they were leaving forever. For the Magyars refused to go on further, refused to follow Bendigaz, whose face was stone, whose eyes were ice, and whose voice was like the, the lash of a whip. The stars and the moon were listening too, and the moon summons a wisp of a cloud to hide its face behind it. The glistening drops of water on the hard faces of the warriors might have been drops of rain from that cloud, might have been tears of the moon, might have been their own tears, who knows. When the moon looked again, the sparkling helmets and spears were hidden in the rising mist. All the moon could see was the flag of the red eagle floating in the wind, moving slowly westward. Slowly, very slowly, from the hold of Europe rose up an army against that flag. More and more armies gathered to check to starve off the impeccable doom that poured out of Cynthia. The fertile, the fertile prairies, the plowed fields, and the green pastures of Samaritia became a battleground where a fresh field of glistening spears grew for each the death had mowed down, where brooks and rivers ran red with blood. Samaritans, Decorans, Goths, Franks, and Romans rallied in desperate efforts to stop the Huns in vain month after month. Year after year, the Huns pressed forward, gaining two victories for each minor defeat. They are not human, spread the rumor uh, in the camps of opposing armies. Survivors of battle and escaped prisoners whispered strange tales, tales which struck terror into the heart of the listeners, tales about a man, Bendigaz, who knew no pity and would tolerate none, Bendigaz, whose face was stone, whose eyes were ice, and who, who would ride into the most frightful slaughters, always without a sword, without armor, carrying a small child on his shoulders. Later, there were tales about Attila, the child whose narrow, slanting, amber-colored eyes were like eyes of an eagle, who always, in, in the van riding a coal-black horse, laughing at death, for death was powerless against him. Attila, whose shrill voice rang out among the turmoil of thousands like a scream of an eagle. The Huns called him the Red Eagle, ran the rumor far and wide, and his father called him Attila, the, scra the scourge of God. The scourge of God echoed the cry from land to land. Fagellum Diem, whispered the Pope Innocentus, and sent his priests into far countries to preach Christianity with renewed zeal to remind the people of the words of the angry Lord. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make the land desolate, and thy city shall be laid to race, rest without inhabitants. For, for this, gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl, for the fierce anger of the Lord is now turned back upon us.
and it in and it seemed as if the Huns were superhuman. Joint armies of many nations became panic stricken, ramble, wrecked, shattered, and trodden down by the dirt of the merciless avalanche of the horsemen. The Huns themselves were like possessed fanatics whose souls the vision of the promised land burned with such a blinding white flame that they could not even see the perils in their path. Their eyes were on Attila, Attila fierce, Attila inv invulnerable. They feared Bendegas, but they worshipped his child. To them he was a symbol, a promise fulfilled by Hudar. He was a great red eagle. And the child Attila, who from the moment of his tragic birth had been deprived of love, tenderness, and comfort, grew hard as steel in body and soul. He learned not to cry when he was but a few days old. Crying did not help. Crying only brought a voice colder than the winds, chilling a small body, sharper than the pains of hunger. The only lullabies he had ever known were rousing war songs, battle cries, and the whine of flying, flying arrows. His only toys were sharp weapons, and he soon learned not to cut himself. For if he did and whimpered with pain, those icy eyes would freeze the whimpers in his throat. He was hardly old enough to walk when he was strapped into a saddle and made to ride at the side of his father for long, weary hours. He learned to handle a bow and arrow before his speech and lost his childish lisp. His young muscles stretched and grew grew taunt and strong, and if they were made sometimes unbearable, no one ever knew it. The first words he learned were the thousand times repeated words of Bendegaz. Fear is sin. Weakness is sin. Those words became his creed and a a hard core around which he built his life. Only after he had learned never to expect help or sympathy from anyone did Bendegaz allow him to mingle with the men. Only then, listening to the tales and songs of the warriors, did he learn of the past of his people and of the future they believed in. And when he heard the story of the tragic night when he was born, a strange new feeling flooded his heart, love and compassion for the silent, cold man who was his father. A great determination surged up in him to find that land, to find the sword of Hudar, to make the world kneel to its power. From then on, the child was a man. The red eagle who laughed at death. Death could not touch him. He was a, he had a promise to fulfill. He was 15 years old. No one knew what had changed the boy into a man overnight, least of all Bendegas. He only saw that Attila was taking more and more burdens of leadership on his own own shoulders. And he, and he had a tremendous army and the grip far stronger than his own had ever been. The way that the serpent the way of the serpent was not the Hun's way. They hated plan, planned campaigns, forged retreats, stealthy midnight attacks. Now, now before Attila, they learned, they learned that all, and no. Now for a now, for Attila, they learned them all and scored more victories than ever before. They still loved the times best when when Hun trumpets blared forth an open challenge to the enemy, and Attila, clad in a scarlet from head to foot, mounted a coal-black steed, awesome like the god of war, led, led them into a whirlwind attack. Then, indeed, did they turn into demons tearing through the enemy's iron ranks as wind tears through the rain, demons roaring with laughter, as the enemy scattered, scampering from, for shelter of scrub and wood, the blood-speckled dust-covered herd trying to escape the doom of the trampling hoofs of swinging sword. At night, after the thundering attacks, they flaunted their wounds, made light of their losses, 
roared with exultation and triumphant songs. One night after one of these sweeping victories, old Bendigaz went to the, to the tent of his son. Attila was asleep. Attila was asleep. His great body relaxed. A thin smile of triumph still lingered around his lips. Bendigaz stood for a long time looking down at him with a growing feeling of awe such as he had not known before. And then, for the night was cold, he removed his own cloak and laid it gently on the sleeping sun. Attila stirred and Bendigaz left the tent quietly, puzzled at his own tender gesture. He walked slowly to the near by hill up on the, its gentle slopes. The sleeping camp spread out below him and above the stars trembled, trembled in the sky. He was alone in the misty night, seemingly in the center of the immense circle formed by the starlit earth and star-spangled sky. Heaven and earth were silent, breathlessly expectantly silent. Silent, and old Bendikaz, alone on the hill, alone with his god, sank slowly to his knees. Hudar, he sighed, sighed, mighty Hudar, I have kept my promise. I have made my son into the most dreadful weapon ever known to man, and now I am frightened for my own handiwork. Twenty years, he cried, his voice suddenly loud, loud, twenty years of war and millions of dead behind him. Was it thy will, Hudar? Will he ever wash himself clean of the blood with the waters of the promised land? Cold stars trembled and the earth remained silent. From above, far beyond the stars, came a voice. And at the sound of it, the crust of ice suddenly melted from the heart of old Bendigaz. A sweet, a voice sweet, soft, and low that his ears did not hear it. He heard it with his heart. Lead me westward, why eagle of the moon, O oh, lead me on silvery rays of the moon. Westward I long to fly. Westward, always westward.